Chapter forty seven C Lityerses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser. Chapter forty seven C Lityerses. Four. The corn spirit slain in his human representatives. The barbarous rites just described offer analogies to the harvest customs of Europe. Thus, the fertilizing virtue ascribed to the corn spirit is shown equally in the savage custom of mixing the victim's blood or ashes with the seed corn, and the European custom of mixing the grain from the last sheaf with the young corn in spring. Again, the identification of the person with the corn appears alike in the savage custom of adapting the age and stature of the victim to the age and stature, whether actual or expected, of the crop. In the Scotch and Styrian rules, that when the corn spirit is conceived as the maiden, the last corn shall be cut by a young maiden, but when it is conceived as the corn mother, it shall be cut by an old woman. In the warning given to old women in Lorraine to save themselves when the old woman is being killed, that is, when the last corn is being threshed, and in the Tyrolese expectation that if the man who gives the last stroke at threshing is tall, the next year's corn will be tall also. Further, the same identification is implied in the savage custom of killing the representative of the corn spirit with hoes or spades, or by grinding him between stones, and in the European custom of pretending to kill him with the scythe or the flail. Once more the conned custom of pouring water on the buried flesh of the victim is parallel to the European customs of pouring water on the personal representative of the corn spirit, or plunging him into a stream. Both the conned and the European customs are rain charms. To return now to the Lityerses story. It has been shown that in rude society human beings have been commonly killed to promote the growth of the crops. There is therefore no improbability in the supposition that they may once have been killed for a like purpose in Phrygia and Europe. And when Phrygian legend and European folk custom, closely agreeing with each other, point to the conclusion that men were so slain, we are bound, provisionally at least, to accept the conclusion. Further, both the Lityerses story and European harvest customs agree in indicating that the victim was put to death as a representative of the corn spirit, and this indication is in harmony with the view which some savages appear to take of the victim slain to make the crops flourish. On the whole, then, we may fairly suppose that both in Phrygia and in Europe the representative of the corn spirit was annually killed upon the harvest field. Grounds have been already shown for believing that similarly in Europe the representative of the tree spirit was annually slain. The proofs of these two remarkable and closely analogous customs are entirely independent of each other. Their coincidence seems to furnish fresh presumption in favour of both. To the question, how was the representative of the corn spirit chosen, one answer has been already given. Both the Lityerses story and the European folk custom show that passing strangers were regarded as manifestations of the corn spirit escaping from the cut or threshed corn, and as such were seized and slain. But this is not the only answer which the evidence suggests. According to the Phrygian legend, the victims of Lityerses were not simply passing strangers, but persons whom he had vanquished in a reaping contest, and afterwards wrapped up in corn sheaves and beheaded. This suggests that the representative of the corn spirit may have been selected by means of competition on the harvest field, in which the vanquished competitor was compelled to accept the fatal honour. The supposition is countenanced by European harvest customs. 
we have seen that in Europe there is sometimes a contest amongst the reapers to avoid being last, and that the person who is vanquished in this competition, that is, who cuts the last corn, is often roughly handled. It is true we have not found that a pretense is made of killing him, but on the other hand we have found that a pretense is made of killing the man who gives the last stroke at threshing, that is, who is vanquished in the threshing contest. Now, since it is in the character of representative of the corn spirit that the thresher of the last corn is slain in mimicry, and since the same representative character attaches, as we have seen, to the cutter and binder as well as to the thresher of the last corn, and since the same repugnance is evinced by harvesters to be last in any one of these labours, we may conjecture that a pretence has been commonly made of killing the reaper and binder, as well as the thresher of the last corn, and that in ancient times this killing was actually carried out. This conjecture is corroborated by the common superstition that whoever cuts the last corn must die soon. Sometimes it is thought that the person who binds the last sheaf on the field will die in the course of next year. The reason for fixing on the reaper, binder, or thresher of the last corn as the representative of the corn spirit may be this. The corn spirit is supposed to lurk as long as he can in the corn, retreating before the reapers, the binders, and the threshers at their work. But when he is forcibly expelled from his refuge in the last corn cut, or last sheaf bound, or the last grain threshed, he necessarily assumes some other form than that of the corn stalks, which had hitherto been his garment or body. And what form can the expelled corn spirit assume more naturally than that of the person who stands nearest to the corn from which he, the corn spirit, has just been expelled? But the person in question is necessarily the reaper, binder, or thresher of the last corn. He or she, therefore, is seized and treated as the corn spirit himself. Thus the person who was killed on the harvest field, as the representative of the corn spirit, may have been either a passing stranger, or the harvester who was last at reaping, binding, or threshing. But there is a third possibility, to which ancient legend and modern folk custom alike point. Lityerses not only put strangers to death, he was himself slain, and apparently in the same way as he had slain others namely by being wrapped in a corn-sheaf, beheaded, and cast into the river, and it is implied that this happened to Lityerses on his own land. Similarly, in modern harvest customs, the pretense of killing appears to be carried out quite as often on the person of the master, farmer or squire, as on that of strangers. Now, when we remember that Lityerses was said to have been a son of the king of Phrygia, and that in one account he is himself called a king, and when we combine with this the tradition that he was put to death, apparently as a representative of the corn spirit, we are led to conjecture that we have here another trace of the custom of annually slaying one of those divine or priestly kings, who are known to have held ghostly sway in many parts of western Asia, and particularly in Phrygia. The custom appears, as we have seen, to have been so far modified in places that the king's son was slain in the king's stead. Of the custom thus modified, the story of Lityerses would be, in one version at least, a reminiscence. Turning now to the relation of the Phrygian Lityerses to the Phrygian Attis, it may be remembered that at Pessinus, the seat of a priestly kingship, the high priest appears to have been annually slain in the character of Attis, a god of vegetation, and that Attis was described by an ancient authority as a reaped ear of corn. Thus Attis, as an embodiment of the corn spirit, annually slain in the person of his representative, might be thought to be ultimately identical with Lityerses, the latter being simply the rustic prototype out of which the state religion of Attis was developed. It may have been so, but, on the other hand, the analogy of European folk custom warns us that amongst the same people two distinct deities of vegetation may have their separate representatives, 
both of whom are slain in the character of gods at different times of the year. For in Europe, as we have seen, it appears that one man was commonly slain in the character of the tree spirit in spring, and another in the character of the corn spirit in autumn. It may have been so in Phrygia also. Attis was especially a tree god, and his connection with corn may have been only such an extension of the power of a tree spirit as is indicated in customs like the harvest may. Again the representative of Attis appears to have been slain in spring, whereas Lityerses must have been slain in summer or autumn, according to the time of the harvest in Phrygia. On the whole, then, while we are not justified in regarding Lityerses as the prototype of Attis, the two may be regarded as parallel products of the same religious idea, and may have stood to each other as in Europe the old man of harvest stands to the wild man, the leaf man, and so forth, of spring. Both were spirits or deities of vegetation, and the personal representatives of both were annually slain. But whereas the Attis worship became elevated into the dignity of a state religion and spread to Italy, the rites of Lityerses seem never to have passed the limits of their native Phrygia, and always retained their character of rustic ceremonies performed by peasants on the harvest field. At most a few villages may have clubbed together, as amongst the corns, to procure a human victim to be slain as representative of the corn spirit for their common benefit. Such victims may have been drawn from the families of priestly kings or kinglets, which would account for the legendary character of Lityerses as the son of a Phrygian king, or as himself a king. When villages did not so club together, each village or farm may have procured its own representative of the corn spirit, by dooming to death either a passing stranger, or the harvester who cut, bound, or threshed the last sheaf. Perhaps in the olden time, the practice of head-hunting as a means of promoting the growth of the corn may have been as common among the rude inhabitants of Europe and Western Asia as it still is, or was till lately, among the primitive agricultural tribes of Assam, Burma, the Philippine Islands, and the Indian archipelago. It is hardly necessary to add that in Phrygia, as in Europe, the old barbarous custom of killing a man on the harvest field, or the threshing floor, had doubtless passed into a mere pretense long before the classical era, and was probably regarded by the reapers and threshers themselves as no more than a rough jest which the license of a harvest home permitted them to play off on a passing stranger, a comrade, or even on their master himself. I have dwelt on the Lityerses song at length, because it affords so many points of comparison with European and savage folk custom. The other harvest songs of Western Asia and Egypt, to which attention has been called above, may now be dismissed much more briefly. The similarity of the Bithynian Bormus to the Phrygian Lityerses helps to bear out the interpretation which has been given of the latter. Bormus, whose death, or rather disappearance, was annually mourned by the reapers in a plaintive song, was, like Lityerses, a king's son, or at least the son of a wealthy and distinguished man. The reapers whom he watched were at work on his own fields, and he disappeared in going to fetch water for them. According to one version of the story, he was carried off by the nymphs, doubtless the nymphs of the spring, or pool, or river, whither he went to draw water. Viewed in the light of the Lityerses story, and of European folk custom, this disappearance of Bormus may be a reminiscence of the custom of binding the farmer himself in a corn-sheaf, and throwing him into the water. The mournful strain which the reapers sang was probably a lamentation over the death of the corn-spirit, slain either in the cut corn, or in the person of a human representative, and the call which they addressed to him may have been a prayer that he might return in fresh vigour next year. The Phoenician Linus song was sung at the vintage, at least in the west of Asia Minor, as we learn from Homer, and this combined with the legend of Sileus, 
suggests that in ancient times passing strangers were handled by vintagers and vine diggers in much the same way as they are said to have been handled by the reaper Lityerses. The Lydian Sileus, so ran the legend, compelled passers by to dig for him in his vineyard till Hercules came and killed him, and dug up his vines by the roots. This seems to be the outline of a legend like that of Lityerses, but neither ancient writers nor modern folk custom enable us to fill in the details. But further the Linus song was probably sung also by Phoenician reapers, for Herodotus compares it to the Maneros song, which, as we have seen, was a lament raised by Egyptian reapers over the cut corn. Further, Linus was identified with Adonis, and Adonis has some claims to be regarded as especially a corn deity. Thus the Linus lament, as sung at harvest, would be identical with the Adonis lament. Each would be the lamentation raised by reapers over the dead spirit of the corn. But whereas Adonis, like Attis, grew into a stately figure of mythology, adored and mourned in splendid cities far beyond the limits of his Phoenician home, Linus appears to have remained a simple ditty sung by reapers and vintagers among the corn sheaves and the vines. The analogy of Lityerses and of folk custom, both European and savage, suggests that in Phoenicia the slain corn spirit, the dead Adonis, may formerly have been represented by a human victim, and this suggestion is possibly supported by the Haran legend that Tammuz, Adonis, was slain by his cruel lord, who ground his bones in a mill and scattered them to the wind. For in Mexico, as we have seen, the human victim at harvest was crushed between two stones, and both in Africa and India the ashes, or other remains of the victim, were scattered over the fields. But the Haran legend may be only a mythical way of expressing the grinding of corn in the mill, and the scattering of the seed. It seems worth suggesting that the mock king who was annually killed at the Babylonian festival of the Sakia, on the sixteenth day of the month Lus, may have represented Tammuz himself. For the historian Berossus, who records the festival and its date, probably used the Macedonian calendar, since he dedicated his history to Antiochus Soter, and in his day the Macedonian month Lus appears to have corresponded to the Babylonian month Tammuz. If this conjecture is right, the view that the mock king at Sakia was slain in the character of a god would be established. There is a good deal more evidence that in Egypt the slain corn spirit, the dead Osiris, was represented by a human victim, whom the reapers slew on the harvest field, mourning his death in a dirge, to which the Greeks, through a verbal misunderstanding, gave the name of Maneros. For the legend of Busiris seems to preserve a reminiscence of human sacrifices once offered by the Egyptians in connection with the worship of Osiris. Busiris was said to have been an Egyptian king who sacrificed all strangers on the altar of Zeus. The origin of the custom was traced to a dearth which afflicted the land of Egypt for nine years. A Cyprian seer informed Busiris that the dearth would cease if a man were annually sacrificed to Zeus. So Busiris instituted the sacrifice. But when Hercules came to Egypt, and was being dragged to the altar to be sacrificed, he burst his bonds, and slew Busiris and his son. Here, then, is a legend that in Egypt a human victim was annually sacrificed to prevent the failure of the crops, and a belief is implied that an omission of the sacrifice would have entailed a recurrence of that infertility which it was the object of the sacrifice to prevent. So the Pawnees, as we have seen, believed that an omission of the human sacrifice at planting would have been followed by a total failure of their crops. The name Busiris was in reality the name of a city, Per Asar, the house of Osiris, the city being so called because it contained the grave of Osiris. 
Indeed, some high modern authorities believe that Busiris was the original home of Osiris, from which his worship spread to other parts of Egypt. The human sacrifices were said to have been offered at his grave, and the victims were red-haired men, whose ashes were scattered abroad by means of winnowing fans. This tradition of human sacrifices offered at the tomb of Osiris is confirmed by the evidence of the monuments. In the light of the foregoing discussion, the Egyptian tradition of Busiris admits of a consistent and fairly probable explanation. Osiris, the corn spirit, was annually represented at harvest by a stranger, whose red hair made him a suitable representative of the ripe corn. This man, in his representative character, was slain on the harvest field, and mourned by the reapers, who prayed at the same time that the corn spirit might revive and return, Ma'a Nerha, Maneros, with renewed vigour in the following year. Finally, the victim, or some part of him, was burnt, and the ashes scattered by winnowing fans over the fields to fertilise them. Here, the choice of the victim, on the ground of his resemblance to the corn which he was to represent, agrees with the Mexican and African customs already described. Similarly, the woman who died in the character of the corn mother at the Mexican midsummer sacrifice had her face painted red and yellow in token of the colours of the corn, and she wore a pasteboard mitre surmounted by waving plumes in imitation of the tassel of the maize. On the other hand, at the festival of the goddess of the white maize, the Mexicans sacrificed lepers. The Romans sacrificed red-haired puppies in spring to avert the supposed blighting influence of the dog-star, believing that the crops would thus grow ripe and ruddy. The heathen of Haran offered to the sun, moon, and planets human victims who were chosen on the ground of their supposed resemblance to the heavenly bodies to which they were sacrificed. For example, the priests, clothed in red and smeared with blood, offered a red-haired, red-cheeked man to the red planet Mars, in a temple which was painted red and draped with red hangings. These, and the like cases of assimilating the victim to the god, or to the natural phenomenon which he represents, are based ultimately on the principle of homeopathic or imitative magic, the notion being that the object aimed at will be most readily attained by means of a sacrifice which resembles the effect that it is designed to bring about. The story that the fragments of Osiris's body were scattered up and down the land, and buried by Isis on the spots where they lay, may very well be a reminiscence of a custom, like that observed by the Khons, of dividing the human victim in pieces, and burying the pieces, often at intervals of many miles from each other, in the fields. Thus, if I am right, the key to the mysteries of Osiris is furnished by the melancholy cry of the Egyptian reapers, which, down to Roman times, could be heard year after year, sounding across the fields, announcing the death of the corn spirit, the rustic prototype of Osiris. Similar cries, as we have seen, were also heard on all the harvest fields of Western Asia. By the ancients they are spoken of as songs, but to judge from the analysis of the names Linus and Maneros, they probably consisted only of a few words uttered in a prolonged musical note, which could be heard at a great distance. Such sonorous and long-drawn cries, raised by a number of strong voices in concert, must have had a striking effect, and could hardly fail to arrest the attention of any wayfarer who happened to be within hearing. The sounds, repeated again and again, could probably be distinguished with tolerable ease, even at a distance. But to a Greek traveller in Asia or Egypt, the foreign words would commonly convey no meaning, and he might take them, not unnaturally, for the name of someone, Maneros, Linus, Litiurses, Bormus, upon whom the reapers were calling. And if his journey led him through more countries than one, as Bithynia and Phrygia, or Phoenicia and Egypt, while the corn was being reaped, 
he would have an opportunity of comparing the various harvest cries of the different peoples. Thus we can readily understand why these harvest cries were so often noted and compared with each other by the Greeks. Whereas, if they had been regular songs, they could not have been heard at such distances, and therefore could not have attracted the attention of so many travellers, and, moreover, even if the wayfarer were within hearing of them, he could not so easily have picked out the words. Down to recent times Devonshire reapers uttered cries of the same sort, and performed on the field a ceremony exactly analogous to that in which, if I am not mistaken, the rites of Osiris originated. The cry and the ceremony are thus described by an observer who wrote in the first half of the nineteenth century. After the wheat is all cut, on most farms in the north of Devon, the harvest people have a custom of crying the neck. I believe that this practice is seldom omitted on any large farm in that part of the country. It is done in this way. An old man, or some one else well acquainted with the ceremonies used on the occasion, when the labourers are reaping the last field of wheat, goes round to the shocks and sheaves, and picks out a little bundle of all the best ears he can find. This bundle he ties up very neat and trim, and plaits and arranges the straws very tastefully. This is called the neck of wheat or wheaten ears. After the field is cut out, and the pitcher once more circulated, the reapers, binders, and the women stand round in a circle. The person with the neck stands in the centre, grasping it with both his hands. He first stoops and holds it near the ground, and all the men forming the ring take off their hats, stooping and holding them with both hands towards the ground. They then all begin at once in a very prolonged and harmonious tone to cry, THE NECK, at the same time slowly raising themselves upright, and elevating their arms and hats above their heads, the person with the neck also raising it on high. This is done three times. They then change their cry to, WE YEN, WE YEN which they sound in the same prolonged and slow manner as before, with singular harmony and effect, three times. This last cry is accompanied by the same movements of the body and arms as in crying, THE NECK. After having thus repeated THE NECK three times, and WE YEN, or WE YEN, as often, they all burst out into a kind of loud and joyous laugh, flinging up their hats and caps into the air, capering about, and perhaps kissing the girls. One of them then gets the neck, and runs as hard as he can down to the farmhouse, where the dairymaid, or one of the young female domestics, stands at the door prepared with a pail of water. If he who holds the neck can manage to get into the house, in any way unseen, or openly, by any other way than the door at which the girl stands with the pail of water, then he may lawfully kiss her, but if otherwise he is regularly soused with the contents of the bucket. On a fine still autumn evening the crying of the neck has a wonderful effect at a distance, far finer than that of the Turkish muezzin, which Lord Byron eulogises so much, and which he says is preferable to all the bells in Christendom. I have once or twice heard upwards of twenty men cry it, and sometimes joined by an equal number of female voices. About three years back, on some high grounds, where our people were harvesting, I heard six or seven necks cried in one night, although I know that some of them were four miles off. They are heard through the quiet evening air, at a considerable distance sometimes. Again Mrs. Bray tells how, travelling in Devonshire, she saw a party of reapers standing in a circle on a rising ground, holding their sickles aloft. One in the middle held up some ears of corn tied together with flowers, and the party shouted three times, what she writes as, Arnak, 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 we haven, we haven, we haven. They went home accompanied by women and children, carrying boughs of flowers, shouting and singing. The man-servant who attended Mrs. Bray said, 
It was only the people making their games, as they always did, to the spirit of harvest. Here, as Miss Byrne remarks, Arnack we haven't, is obviously, in the Devon dialect, a neck or knack we haven't. Another account of this old custom, written at Truro in 1839, runs thus. Now, when all the corn was cut at Heligan, the farming men and maidens come in front of the house, and bring with them a small sheaf of corn, the last that has been cut, and this is adorned with ribbons and flowers, and one part is tied quite tight, so as to look like a neck. Then they cry out, Our side, my side, as loud as they can. Then the dairymaid gives the neck to the head farming man. He takes it, and says very loudly three times, I have him, I have him, I have him. Then another farming man shouts very loudly, What have you, what have you, what have you? Then the first says, A neck, a neck, a neck. And when he has said this, all the people make a very great shouting. This they do three times, and after one famous shout, go away and eat supper, and dance, and sing songs. According to another account, all went out to the field when the last corn was cut, the neck was tied with ribbons and plaited, and they danced round it, and carried it to the great kitchen, where by and by the supper was. The words were as given in the previous account, and, Hip, ha, ha, heck, I have it, I have it, I have it. It was hung up in the hall. Another account relates that one of the men rushed from the field with the last sheaf, while the rest pursued him with vessels of water, which they tried to throw over the sheaf before it could be brought into the barn. In the foregoing customs, a particular bunch of ears, generally the last left standing, is conceived as the neck of the corn spirit, who is consequently beheaded when the bunch is cut down. Similarly, in Shropshire, the name neck, or the gander's neck, used to be commonly given to the last handful of ears left standing in the middle of the field, when all the rest of the corn was cut. It was plaited together, and the reapers, standing ten or twenty paces off, threw their sickles at it. Whoever cut it through was said to have cut off the gander's neck. The neck was taken to the farmer's wife, who was supposed to keep it in the house for good luck till the next harvest came round. Near Treve, the man who reaps the last standing corn cuts the goat's neck off. At Fass Lane, on the Gerloch, Dumbartonshire, the last handful of standing corn was sometimes called the head. At Aurich, in East Friesland, the man who reaps the last corn cuts the hare's tail off. In mowing down the last corner of a field, French reapers sometimes call out, We have the cat by the tail! In Bresse, Bourgogne, the last sheaf represented the fox. Beside it a score of ears were left standing to form the tail, and each reaper, going back some paces, threw his sickle at it. He who succeeded in severing it cut off the fox's tail, and a cry of Yukuku was raised in his honour. These examples leave no room to doubt the meaning of the Devonshire and Cornish expression, the neck, as applied to the last sheaf. The corn spirit is conceived in human or animal form, and the last standing corn is part of its body, its neck, its head, or its tail. Sometimes, as we have seen, the last corn is regarded as the navel string. Lastly, the Devonshire custom of drenching with water the person who brings in the neck is a rain charm, such as we have had many examples of. Its parallel in the mysteries of Osiris was the custom of pouring water on the image of Osiris, or on the person who represented him. End of chapter 47